So I, I'm going to be taking a trip to Japan if everything works out. I, I know Ramon's probably listening today, so uh, he, he's going to be uh, coming with me. We're going to go with the Drone Code Foundation to the Ross Expo that's happening there. So that's robotics. And I kind of, uh, you know, thinking about infrastructure with what Yolanka and Rex had been uh, bringing to the table today, found this article about smart cities and i thought it was interesting because the central planning for these things in japan uh, i think there's three mentioned in the article all of which are kind of sponsored or brought to you by panasonic um <laughs> which it makes it even more central it's not just the government planning it's centrally it's almost like a a company town which i think has very different contexts in japan uh culturally uh with the zaibatsu uh than it does here but also, is that even something that's workable? So in this article, what's really interesting is they have everything down from facial recognition to even sleep patterns uh, are being tracked to help people, I don't know, with airflow so they could sleep better. With Japan, the concern here and the reason that these uh, these kind of smart towns, actually, uh, they're pretty small, anywhere from 500 to 2,000 people, but fully sustainable systems with, you know, solar panels and you see this nice little friendly robot there um is that they have an aging population that they need to take care of and that's why there's an interest in kind of building this from soup to nuts kind of smart city solution um i guess my question to our guests and don is can you centrally plan something like that to operate at scale it's one thing to have 2,000 people for like almost a retirement village uh, but it seems almost antithetical to the way that humans kind of conduct themselves that you would be able to plan everybody's sleep patterns in a city and you know the HVAC systems around that so who wants to go first Rex Yolanka sure I think it's uh, the biggest challenge is the information overload uh, it's like um, a computer may be able to uh, dissect some of this on a regular basis, but how do I get it to the individuals uh, in the community? Because there's only so much bandwidth that allows for communications. And when you're looking at some of this, we, we, we talk about this is how do, you, how do you present information that's actionable in a real time environment? And that's a real struggle. And how much information is viable information? We get inundated with so much garbage every single day when we're trying to make decisions, it's like, okay, I can't make a decision because I have no idea what information yeah, data is the right information. It's like, it's just overwhelming for the average person. Um, we, we deal with that in aviation all the time. It's like, how much information should I introduce to the cockpit that won't overwhelm the pilot? So he's now so confused and distracted that he's not getting anything accomplished. And he's no longer or flying she. the aircraft. Or she. Uh, or, uh, and, and, you know, they. What, th this kind of frightens me a little bit, you know, going back, kind of riffing off of what, what Rex said earlier about, you know, kind of language and, you know, this whole idea of service and that Yolanka's report brought up. What what are we really doing here, you know, like with collecting information on sleep patterns for airflow? Like that's that's a little weird and frightening to me, honestly. Um, you know, what is, what is, I, I guess I could see this, oh, we're getting photobombed by a little puppy back there. Uh, I just squirreled, sorry. Um, <laughs> I, I guess I could see the, the value of that, but are people opting into this or is this yes. just like, the, this is an opt-in only system okay. for the facial tracking. So any of the other systems, um, would have to be supported by, you know, not, not identifying you specifically. Um, yeah. so we got two and, comments, and uh, Chris Wedgworth is part 108 real. That's probably from a little while ago. But we have uh, Kisuki Yasukochi. Sorry if I got your name a little wrong. Uh, didn't even know this is happening, even living here in Japan. So Oh, wow. This... <laughs> you heard it here first. And Yolanka yeah. has a comment, it looks like. I Yeah, I do. So kind of going um, back to this que uh, your question, Mike, about... Um, you know, this is 2,000 people, what does this look like when you expand it? So first, you know, I think we're seeing this in other places as well. I know um, in the Netherlands, um, they have created Alzheimer or dementia villages um, where um, they do similar tracking and it allows people 
who have dementia to, um, to interact at, um, in a small town village type setting, but safely with trackers and things like that. Um, so, I, you know, I don't think I don't think this is unique to Japan. I think it will look differently wherever you were. But I, but I do think, from a scalability perspective, I think um, you know my thought would be that there's a certain kind of functional unit size for which this works. Um, I, I think that you know scaling this up to a large city size maybe isn't as feasible as creating kind of these modules of, and, and maybe maybe 2,000 people is the right number, maybe 5,000 people is the right number. But um, I, I think part, part of what works about this is the community aspect. And so I would be curious to see if, if, uh, um, if they're actually thinking they can scale this up to the mil million people size, or would they be, fun you know, just more modules like this? Yeah, you know, I, it's, I, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, well, it's interesting because uh, the article doesn't kind of let you know which way they're thinking. I think it's inferring that, but probably not likely. But, you know, just thinking about it with a little bit of different spin, um, how is this different than, you know, a, a normal development in the United States or a gated community, right? If everybody knows that when they buy property there, they're opting into that uh, community's systems, and that includes, you know, garbage collection, electricity, etc. cetera, uh, it kind of makes sense. And But a modular approach seems like there, it, it seems more likely that there would be hundreds of of these or thousands of these than it would be a complete top-down thing like giant cities uh, like New York or Los Angeles or Tokyo, for example. I, I guess what scares me about this, because I'm generally speaking a glass half empty kind of gal, is the dark side of this. I mean, this might be far-fetched, but you know, going back to Rex's point about like words matter and what, what, how we define things, how are we defining this term smart city? You know, because if if that by definition, or at least for this community means we're collecting your facial information, we're collecting your sleep patterns, you know, and, and they're using it to help them, like Yolanka said, for example, in the Netherlands um, village with Alzheimer's patients. But, you know, w what about the dark side? I mean, who's to say that, like, somebody hacks this or what can be done with that information? <laughs> I've been watching uh, The Man in the High Castle, and I know this is just fiction. But, you know, here just in the show last night, um, you know, the, spoiler alert, if you haven't watched it yet, there's there's a young man, one of the, the lead Nazi son, you know, he has muscular dystrophy. And they learn it through a routine physical and that means he needs to be euthanized because he's he's a useless eater. And so, like, again, taking this to the nth degree of you collect this data from people, uh, what can be done with it? I mean, we talked about this, remember, Mike, was it last week or the week before uh, with the, you know, the AI that was going through hospital records for preventive medicine? Like, yeah. oh, this is so great. Oh, we'll never we be can used tell for you in insurance advance. was the claim. Yeah, and like, oh, your insurance <laughs> won't be raised. You know, but yeah. it's like, really? If the information's uh, so, there, it'll be found. Yeah, what, what else can be done with this info? That's the, I would want very strict rules around what can, this data can be used for if I'm opting in. And what mm -hmm. I hate to see is a whole bunch of these communities, nowhere else to live, you have, it almost like, you know, to use your computer, you have to sign that little consent thing, even though nobody reads it, what they're going to use it for. <laughs> you know, it's like, I have no choice but to live here. And so... I guess I'm signing the dotted line and God knows what my information is going to be used yeah, for. So I, I almost think down. there's, you know, th used. there might be, a, in a in a perfect future, it would be understood that a person couldn't possibly recognize what they're signing over. Uh, yeah. If, it, if yeah. it's past a certain amount of information, yeah. right? It's, yeah. Well, and I think you look at some of the other countries out there that are using these, this data as a weapon so uh, we yeah. can look at how this creates a kind of a dystopian influence is you have a scale you have a, uh, a citizenship scale and if you do certain things it goes up if you do other things or don't participate in things it goes down and that influences your ability to travel buy things where you can work uh yeah it's really it's really scary 
that's like Black Mirror type stuff. I don't know if anybody's watched that show. They mm-hmm. they had a, 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 an episode where it was like social media, same thing, Rex. Like how many likes you got from people. Like when you ordered your coffee, like the barista would like rate you as a customer. Mm-hmm. And if you didn't get a lot of likes, exactly that. Like you start getting ostracized. You can't buy coffee there anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, just interesting yeah, stuff. It, I think we have a couple comments. Yeah, we have got a, we've sure. got a couple comments. Uh, Tony Drummond's got two. There must be 100 smart city concepts. They are all idealistic, and some concepts are frankly disconnected. Yeah, this is one of the things with uh, smart cities. It's almost like w- what we saw, I would say, three or four, maybe five years ago with like AAM air taxi type thing where it was sold as the flying car um and then another question from her or a comment from her dom we heard a lot of information not very realistic operationally so i asked her to uh elaborate on misinfo hopeful hopefully that uh tony will get back to us and then we also have chris wedgworth scary so we have been talking a little bit about the scarier aspects but i do want to kind of return to some of the the functional stuff like Electric good stuff, um, you know, having the solar panels built in and that kind of managed uh, from the get-go, having other kind of streetlight systems uh, work in terms of foot traffic flow, if there's going to be cars coming down that road versus more people at any time of day. These are all things that I think are net positives. Um, But yes, we have to discuss these things from the data perspective and the data aggregation perspective, especially when, in this case, you'd be signing into a private community, you know, owned by, not owned or run by a corporation, wasn't very clear. Um, You know, that's a lot of personal data to give over to somebody just to have these little niceties um, that you could probably get outside of that anyway. Um, So Chris Wedgworth also said... Uh, that was on The Simpsons about the coffee shop. So <laughs> <laughs> it was on Black Mirror too. Yeah. Just saying. Yolanda, what do you, what do you have? Yeah. So first of all, Man the High Castle, great series, and uh, yes, clearly, clearly dystopian, but fab- fabulous show. Um, but I, I also just want to interject here that um, the term smart cities gets tossed around a lot, and and I don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Uh, and and say you know let let's dump the idea of smart cities there there's a lot of good work going on um uh around smart cities and i i'm just gonna call out where i'm sitting right now you know columbus ohio um uh won uh the first smart city challenge that was held by the us dot and they got 50 million in grant funding um, and the designation as America's smart city. And what they're doing is reinventing transportation to accelerate human progress. So I think that we can go down a dystopian path. We can also, you know, with, with, some, with some guardrails, with some boundaries, um, also do a lot of great things with technology that improves the the human condition. So I, you know, yeah. I, I just don't want to be too uh, bright line, black and white about it. Yeah. No, yeah. I to- I totally agree. I, you know, I feel like there's a there's a this there's a major difference between collecting people's sleep patterns, eating habits, and you know, foot tr- anonymized foot traffic. So you know, like when the lights needs to change, right? For you yes. know, for yeah, or where there's surge, uh, you know, traffic times. Uh, exactly. In an area. Exactly. You know, or I think or that's- even. Yeah, even something as as um, something like uh, mass mobility as a service, where you have an app that allows kind of the complete trip um, perspective, um, where I, as a traveler, want to go from A to B, and I through an app can see my different choices, see what combination different combinations I can take, what it will cost, how much time it will take, and I can make my choice kind yeah. of irrespective of what company is providing what service. Yeah, I and, think and DC that's... does that with the Metro. I mean, just yes. with their Metro, but you can check and see how long it's going to take if you go this way or that way. Um, and I think that's great. You're right, informed choices. Yeah, we got a great comment from Tony that kind of wraps into uh, my perspective on this. So at least at the last conference, we had a lot of conflicting information, theoretical versus actually operationally viable. 
it's slightly confusing. We need to define smart cityscapes. So I, I think uh, a simpler way to e understand what uh, the next step is, is more like digital transformation for city systems, right? So in Yolanka's example of you use the app and that gives you, you know, the direct path from point A to point B and point C, uh, so you can you can get there as easy as possible without having to you know like look on the phone, see the bus schedule, map that with the train schedule, etc. Now also take the fact that we've ingested that data and now it affects the transportation systems themselves, how they self-organize. Do we run an extra bus today? Do we change the light light pattern so the buses can get through at this hour more readily without stopping the regular flow of traffic? That's kind of the next evolution, and without that data layer, you can't do that. You're on the same system that we're on now, which is the lights go off and, and on at this interval, and we think that works until we see a traffic jam, and then we respond the next day. Yeah. So, yeah. So circling, circling back to advanced air mobility, I think that begs an interesting question um, because you're right. It's not just um, it's not just the there's the planning aspect and the regulatory aspect, but there's real time operations and optimization of that. And, um, and we see some of that now in transportation um, systems within metropolitan regions where if you have but, you know, bus, line, uh, bus uh, transit and light rail and let's say you have a light rail line go down, um, now you've got to have um, the transit company come in with more buses to, to kind of accommodate. I think what is interesting, it, uh, will be interesting, is to see um, how we integrate real-time operations with aviation, with advanced air mobility. Because again, it's not a, it's not a place where aviation's used to going um, to kind of uh, adjust real-time operations based on non-aviation transportation factors. So, um, but I think that will be critical um, for the success of the system, including the success of advanced air, air mobility, if you have a light rail line go down and you've got a vertiport at a busy light rail station where, where people um, switch modes and that light rail line is down, how does that affect the urban um, air taxi operations um, if, if there's no point in bringing people there. So, and vice versa, you have a bad weather day and people can't take their air taxis to that light rail station to get on their light rail uh, ride uh, for the next leg. So I think um, there's, there's a lot of interesting work to be done